Everyone, how? Good morning. There it is. Thank you. Uh, we're so glad that you are here. My name is Craig. I'm the pastor of this church, and you are at Oakland Presbyterian Church, which is an awesome, awesome place to be this morning. So welcome to all of you. Want you to please take out, uh, if you have a smartphone, take it out, point it at that QR code right now, and go to the connection card button on the app that should come up, and that's uh, a way for us to know that you're here. So please let us know that you are here, whether you're a member or an attender, just kind of sign in with us. Uh, if you are a visitor, boy, we'd sure like to know more about you, share with us a way we can contact you and send you, give us an email address so we can send you some of the stuff we have as our e-newsletters, and uh, that's a way you can get to know some of the stuff that we are about as a church and how we are engaged with our community here. So thanks for using that. Then also, you can uh, give securely. This is the primary way that we do our offering is electronically. It's touchless, and it's secure, and it's confidential. And uh, it's there for you through the app. However, if you don't want to use your phone, that's fine too. We have paper connection cards. Should be one in front of you. You can fill out. And then if you brought your offering in hand with you today, you can take the card and the offering. There's a drop box in the narthex, the vestibule back there. And then there's one that's right over here as well as you leave today. Um, we are getting excited about next week. So I need everybody's eyes on me. Eyes on me. I need everybody's attention because next week you need to know that we are only meeting once. We're having one worship service and it's not at 11 o'clock and it's not at 845. It is at 1030 and we are going to gather as a whole church and we are going to celebrate because it is the 135th anniversary of Oakland Presbyterian Church. God has been good, has done great things. We have an exciting future. We want to get uh, excited and ready for that, so we are going to celebrate. And as Presbyterians love to do, we're going to have an old-fashioned traditional potluck right afterwards. And yes, if you have uh, a side dish or a main dish that you would like to share, then bring it. All you have to do is drop it off next Sunday when you arrive in the CLC. Uh, and there'll be signs to show you where to go. The, our team will take that from you and then you can come to worship and it'll be all ready for when we get over there for our potluck lunch. Don't bring a dessert because we are having a birthday cake that we can all share. And it's going to be a great celebration. So thanks for making it a priority next week and coming on time at 1030 and ready to stay for the potluck. Then also, you, if you are on our email list, you should have received an invitation to take a very important survey. And if you have taken that survey... Thank you. If you have not, we'll get on that this week. We want to know your talents and your interested in your interests and your gifts. It's a way for us to reconnect as a church family and figure out what islands of strength that we have in this church and in this congregation that we can build on. So please fill out that survey. It takes about 20 minutes online. And if you're not online and if you have not received the email, then we have paper surveys that are in the narthex as you leave. Pick one up, fill it out, make sure you put your name on it, and uh, then bring it back to us as soon as you can so that we can, um, we can learn a little bit more about each other. All right, let's prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God.
ourselves to worship with the words. They're in your bulletin and they're up on the screen. God is like a potter who shapes and forms our lives. We have been called to be faithful to God's intention. God seeks for us to be vessels of compassion and service. We have been given multiple opportunities to witness to God's love. Come, let us worship the Creator who has given us life. Let us send our praises to God who knows us totally and loves us. Amen. Amen. One of the things we trust Jesus with is our faith and our need for forgiveness because we believe that on the cross, Jesus died for our sins. Jesus died to set us free from all that locks us in guilt and shame and regret so that we can live in freedom. So I have a prayer for us all, to, a confessing prayer for us all to pray together and then I'm going to give you some time for your own personal silent meditation, and I'll bring it back together with some good news. Let's pray. Forgiving God, we have not treated this world or one another with compassionate love. We have turned our backs on situations of need in which we could have been instruments of help, healing, and peace. We have neglected service to others and have focused our lives on accumulating things and status. Please forgive us, Lord. Refashion us to be your people, celebrating your love in service to others. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
the good news that we proclaim in this place, we call it the gospel, is this, that God's loving choice for you is peace and hope. God has fashioned you to be God's people. So rejoice, for God is with you, he is reaching out to you, he is forgiving you, and he is caring for you. Know that in Christ you are forgiven, and be at peace. Amen and amen, and let's share the peace with each other. Get to as many people as you can. Make sure no one is left out.
And now at this time, I invite all the children to join me for Children's Church. is taken from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. This is the word of the Lord. Um, at the 845 service, the uh, scripture that print is printed in your bulletin did not match the scripture that Rosanna just read. And I'm assuming that happened again with this service. Is it different in the bulletin? Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. We'll make sure that uh, doesn't happen too often. Uh, but uh, you just heard, and we are in John chapter 20, beginning with verse 19. That's the official Verse. So if you're following along, please turn to that. But um, you know what we've been doing is we've been recognizing the fact that for this church at least, and I know it's more churches than us, but for this church at least, uh, we went through a time when there was huge disruption in our practices, in our schedule, and who we are, our identity during COVID, during the pandemic. And on top of that, this church was going through a pastoral transition. And those are never easy. It feels like a really long wait to figure out what's going to happen next. But then you had COVID on top of that. I mean, it was kind of like a perfect storm. So we're trying to reconnect with each other and specifically reconnect with the scriptures about who we are. What is the church? What are we called to do um, and be? What can we be? What could we be as a church? And kind of open up our imaginations a little bit. So today we're going to talk uh, about uh, something, but I wanted to start out with a question. Think, talking about disruption, what do you think has, has made the biggest impact, something from the outside that has made the biggest impact on the church in like the last 70 years. What do you think that is? And if you got an idea, just, just shout it out. What do you think has make the, made the biggest impact on the church in the last 70 years here in America? The internet. Uh, that's a good, good candidate. Still trying to figure out what that's going to mean, but what else? Speak out loud so I can hear you. Decline in church membership has been a big deal. We asked the question, well, why has that been the case, right? What else? Transition? People moving. People are more mobile. Okay. You're getting close to what I think about. Any other ideas? Here's what I think it is. Biggest impact on the church in the last 70 years has been the car. The car. The automobile. We don't call them automobiles anymore, do we? You don't really hear that word very much. You don't say, I'm going to go out. I left my wallet in my automobile. I'm going to come. Let's get in the automobile and go down to the drive-in, get an ice cream cone. Um, no, we talk, it's cars. So what am I talking about? Well, well the average American right now spends, uh, goes 37 miles per day in their car. That's the average, 37 miles per day. 
And time-wise, they spend a little less than an hour per day in their car. Average American spends that much time in their car. And they use the car to do pretty much everything that's going on in their lives. They use a car to go to work, use a car to go to school, use a car to go to practice, to games, to rehearsals and performances. You use the car to go to Starbucks. You use the car to go to the shopping center. You go you use the car to go to the grocery store. You use the car to go to the theme park and to go to the beach. You're using the car all the time. And so th- the reason that that has made an impact on the church is because now if you have a car, you don't mind... You are okay with driving more than five miles to get to the church that you want to go to. And that's made all the difference. It's made all the difference. It's changed everything for the church. Because now, what people say when they're looking for a church They will say things like, I'm looking for a church that has a great children's program, has a great youth program, has a a dynamic and inspiring pastor, and and they're singing music that I like, and it's instruments that I know, and and they uh, have a location that I really like, and and they're big, or they're small, or they're medium, or they um, uh, 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 have the same political views that I do, or they line up with me doctrinally. And so people are thinking through this long list of things that they like or dislike, and that's what they're using to evaluate the church. And, and then they drive. They get in their car, and they drive to that church, and they don't mind passing a dozen other churches on the way where they're just entertained by all the church signs. Yeah, so they pass... Yeah, I like that one. (laughs) Why do we have church signs on the road? So when people are driving by, right, they get a message that hopefully will inspire them to come to that church. Make them giggle or make them think or whatever. And, And that has made a huge impact. Before the car... People decided what church to go to based on the one that was nearest to them, period. The one you could walk to, the one that was in your neighborhood, right? Or, if you went a little farther, it's because it was where your family worshipped, your extended family, or because you were born into a tradition, a denomination that had your, your family had gone to for generations. That's how you chose a church, but not anymore. People rarely choose a church based on those reasons because they have a car and they don't mind using it to get to the church that they want to go to. So, of course, there's been a response from churches, right? I mean, we see that this is a change. We have to adapt to that change. And so what have churches done to adapt to the change? Well, for one, if you build a new church, in other words, you're going to buy a property, you're going to put a building on it these days, you need a much bigger property, a much bigger amount of land than you used to before. Why? Parking. In fact, most of the lot is taken, most of the property is taken up with nothing but pavement and asphalt and stripes. That's the biggest part of the church building, footprint-wise, is, is the parking. And if you really want to make sure people know where to find you, where do you build the church? On a major thoroughfare, right? High-priced real estate. The church wants in on that because it's easy to find a church. It's easy to get not back in the neighborhood where nobody can find you with no parking, lots of parking right on a major thoroughfare. It has changed everything. And what it also has changed is how churches approach their identity and their ministry. Because now what they need to do is they need to attract 
people in their cars so they will drive their cars to that church. How are we going to attract these people was really a new conversation for the church in the last 50, 70 years. Attract people, well, it doesn't matter. They're just going to come to our church if they're Presbyterian or they live in the neighborhood. No, not anymore. You have to do more. You have to make sure you have an awesome set of programs. You need to hire that charismatic celebrity pastor that's just going to wow everybody and everybody wants to come here because their sermons are so awesome on Sunday. You have to really get your music tight and it has to be trendy and has to be contemporary because that's what people want. That's what people listen to all the time. Um, You have to uh, really make sure that your building is in top-notch shape because people are coming in and they're evaluating on how they can get around and if it's easy to get from point A to point B. You have to make sure your messaging is on point and your social media platforms are on point because the goal is to attract people. The goal is to attract people, to be attractional. And that really sets the agenda for the church. Um, However, when that's the agenda of the church, then what happens is that the church really is invested in making sure people, sure people stay put. Once they've driven there in their cars, that they're not going to go anywhere else. So you have to make sure that the message is positive and encouraging and relevant. And, and here's the deal. You're probably going to stay away from parts of the gospel that's presented in the Bible that are going to be icky. I-C-K-Y, icky that are going to be tough and challenging. You're not going to talk a whole lot in in modern churches in North America about the path of suffering that, oh, by the way, Jesus followed. And he said, take up your cross and follow me. But you're not going to hear very much about the path of suffering because that's going to turn people off. It's going to make them uncomfortable. You're not going to hear messages about humility And you're not going to see that as a value in the church. Instead, you're going to hear about being aggressive and about being bold. But what about being humble? Is that a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Was Jesus humble as a Savior? And what about sacrifice? Uh, the, the, The idea that we're giving ourselves up to God so that we can be used in service to him in the world, wherever we are called and wherever we are sent. See, the problem is, is if you start making people uncomfortable, they will start thinking about getting in their cars and going to another church just a couple miles away that will make them more comfortable. So you can see, can't you? It's changed everything. And here's the last thing I think it has impacted. As the church has become more attractional, it has become more disconnected from the neighborhood in which it is in, in it, which it is placed. That we are uh, in buildings that are buffered from our neighbors by huge parking lots. And we're on major thoroughfares or people zoom in and zoom out. We do not know anymore what the the needs and the concerns and the hurts of of the people who are living and working and conducting their lives closest to the front door of the church. We we just don't know our neighbors anymore. And I'm kind of going, well, wait a minute. Isn't part of of Jesus' uh, command, Jesus' burden on the church is to love your neighbors? We don't even know who they are. That's what's happening uh, in the church. And my response to that is the belief that I have, based on what the Bible, I think, teaches over and over again, that your address is not an accident. Your address is never an accident. I'm talking to the Christians now. If you follow Jesus, then you believe that God has intention for everything that you do, and you are part of God's plan, and that includes where God puts you. So as an individual Christian, wherever you live, 
wherever you work, wherever you interact with others, you are there by divine command and arrangement. And your calling, your mission, is to share good news in all that you say and all that you do. You're not only proclaiming, but you're demonstrating the good news of God's love and God's compassion and God's desire to heal and bring reconciliation to all the broken places of the world. We get to do that starting in our homes and in our workplaces and in our neighborhoods, the people that live around us. We get to embody that. And then as a church, we do the same thing. This, this, this church's address is not an accident. It's God's intention that we are here on Oakland Avenue. So what are we going to do about it? Well, what we should be doing, what we could do, is we could find out what's going on with our neighbors who also are placed here by God. How do we share connection? How do we, how do we know what's going on in their lives? And there's a movement right now in Christianity I'm super excited about. For me, it's made a huge difference. I think it can make a huge difference in a church where it's kind of trying to get away from that whole attractional model because, frankly, it's problematic. It's really problematic. For a church to be thinking about its whole ministry in terms of how many people it can get to come to its location. Instead, how can we get out into our community and love our neighbors? The idea is, is it's not about what people get when they come here from us. It's about what people get from us when we go out there. That's how we should be evaluating. That should be our agenda for ministry. And there's a movement going on right now, not only in the North American church, but in Europe and in other continents of the world, to, to, to challenge the church to think about the mission field that it's called to, its own location, its own neighborhood. Start there, and everything else will fall into place. Hmm. What do you think about that? Well, let me give you a personal experience that I've had with this. When I arrived uh, in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho in 2011, I could tell right away it was going to be easy. It was going to be so easy. Why? Because the church was located right smack dab in the middle of this bustling little downtown. It was a touristy town, but there were also a lot of people who lived uh, near downtown in quaint little neighborhoods. People lived in condo towers that had been put up. Uh, there were people working downtown and all sorts of offices and banks and, and restaurants and, and hotel. There's a big resort hotel that was there. Um, there were a lot of people that just came downtown to hang out uh, on the e in the evenings or on the weekends. It was a popular, popular place. And I'm just like rubbing my hands going, oh my. Gosh, this is great. All you have to do is walk out the front door, and just a few steps, you are in the midst of hundreds of people. And so what I started to do after I got there is, is I would kind of take time out in my week to work at a coffee shop. Now, this is the Northwest. And in the Northwest, people love their coffee. I mean, it, it's, it's crazy kind of passion, coffee. Um, in fact, you know, I think in Winter Garden, there's maybe three coffee houses. In Coeur d'Alene, about the same size downtown, there were five or six coffee houses, and they were always full. They were busting at the seams all the time, all day long, all night. People loved their coffee. So what I would do is I kind of made a rotation. You know, I would just visit the coffee houses, and I would just sit there with my you know, laptop, and, and I'd do a little work, but I was always kind of attuned to the people around me, and if I got an opportunity to have a conversation, man, I, I was all over that. I'd stop whatever I was doing and have a conversation, and, and hopefully we'd start to talk about some spiritual matters once they found out what I did. And, and, but the main thing that I wanted to find out was this. I wanted to, to know their hope for a church that was located right downtown. I asked them, what do you hope for that church? Well, most of them initially in those early days said, I didn't even know there was a church downtown. 
they didn't even know we were there. And believe me, it, this church was right in the middle of downtown. You, they probably drove by it dozens, if not hundreds of times. But they didn't know there was a church there. The church had made very little impact in its downtown. That was already starting to change when I got there. But man, I could see right away that was number one priority was to get out from behind our four walls. And so what we looked for was something called third places. Have you ever heard of that term? Third places? It's not where people work. It's not where people live. It's the third place where they hang out. Where they just, that's where they choose to go in their, in their off time. And in downtown Coeur d'Alene, there were tons of third places happening all the time. There was a farmer's market that happened on Wednesday evenings. Not quite as big as Winter Garden, but close. And it was popular. Lots and lots of people, lots and lots of families came down to do their produce shopping. And so what we did is we put together a kid zone right next to the farmer's market with bounce houses and face painting. And we, uh, as we did that, 90% of the families visited our kid zone that came to the farmer's market. 90%. We knew that because we counted the number of kids who had face painting on versus the kids who didn't. 90%. Um, in a Halloween, they had a big downtown Halloween trick-or-treat with all the businesses. And so the business association asked us, the church, to do a trunk-or-treat in kind of a big grassy lot that was just right downtown. Um, there was a pocket park downtown. And again, the, the, the town, the, the, uh, the city, and the and a business association came to us and said, boy, we'd really love to have a great Christmas family event in this pocket park could you do that for us? And we said, absolutely. So we, uh, we called it Nativity, and uh, it was a Christmas petting zoo. Yeah, ca with a camel and everything. Yeah, and uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people uh, came, families came uh, to do this. We teamed up with a couple other churches to do it as well. And uh, it, there was a, um, uh, you could dress up and do a nativity scene photo shoot uh, that we would do for you. It was really fun. But not just getting into the third places and, and getting connected to our community outside our four walls, but we also asked the question, what are the greatest needs that people have closest to our front door? And what we discovered was it was a, a tourist destination, which meant that there were a lot of restaurants, really good restaurants, and a lot of variety. There were lots of coffee houses, as I said, but there were also lots of bars and night spots. There was a big resort that was downtown. People worked in there, and people that worked at a couple of other kind of boutique hotels that were downtown. Lots of people, in other words, in the restaurant and hospitality industry. And as we got to know them specifically, we found out they had a ton of needs. People that were in that industry tended to be dealing with odd hours, um, the pay wasn't great. Often you had to have two or three jobs just to break even and to survive. Um, there was a high institute, inst instance of alcohol and drug abuse within that sector of people. People tended to have very disrupted uh, uh, relational lives and family lives. Sometimes there was abuse and there was neglect. And uh, it was just... It was, these people were experiencing a lot of hardships in their life, so we asked the question, what if we tried to reach out specifically to them and care for them? What would that look like? And that led to starting a nonprofit that was devoted to providing emergency care to people who were in crisis who worked in that industry, referred by their managers and their owners, or self-referral, or from a coworker. And that would then lead into long-term care and relationship with them. And then our goal was is that they would agree to have a mentor. And the mentor would walk beside them through life and just help them to navigate life in a better way than what they were trying to do before. And the cool thing about this, this, this has gone gangbusters ever since. And it's gotten to the point where the church doesn't own it anymore. We're not the only ones staffing it. We're not the only ones doing it. Now the town owns it. It is theirs, and they are stepping up and making it a huge 
priority. It's been astronomical, the growth. They've hired staff now, and they have their own office space, and it's, it's just been crazy. So all of that was basically saying, we're in a neighborhood. We're in this downtown on purpose. This is where we are meant to be. So how do we connect with this place? I can tell you that that church grew for sure. Absolutely, it grew numerically, for sure. But what was more important to us is that the church's reputation went through the roof in that community. We were known as good neighbors. We were valued as a church that was making a difference in people's lives. And because of that, we knew for sure that Jesus' reputation was way higher than it had been before. And that was the goal. So finally getting around to John chapter 20, let me just, as we close, let me just point out, I think, how this comes through scripturally in a powerful way. And we, in, in, in verse 19, we are meeting the disciples as they are in a time of crisis. They are in a time of fear, terror, panic. They, they are behind locked doors. Uh, they are hiding, and they may be plotting to try to figure out how they can escape, how they can get away. Um, one commentator said this, They had narrowly escaped arrest. They were known as the disciples of one who was regarded as a dangerous agitator, and they were probably consulting together on how best to withdraw from the city without attracting notice. Withdrawn from the city. Behind locked doors, sheltered by four walls, not attracting notice, almost giving the impression they're trying to get out rather than be in. That's not good for a church, is it? This was the first church. The disciples were the first church. This was, a, this was not a good place to be. So what happens? Jesus intervenes right then and right then there. This is after the resurrection. This is after the crucifixion. This is after the trial. This is after the, the torture and the beatings. Jesus is now risen, and Jesus appears to them in that room, locked away, and he says, the first thing he says is, peace. Be at peace. Do not be afraid. Don't be scared of what's going on outside these four walls. I, I got it. I got you. You are my people. And my Holy Spirit will be with you. You're going to be okay. Don't try to run away. Stay put. Stay until Pentecost. The next thing he says is what? Look at verse 21. What does he say there? As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And he's not sending them to a rocked away room. He's sending them out. He's sending them to go and and do what he was called to do, what he was sent to do. Heal, teach, counsel, um, shepherd, oppose the self-righteous. Just as I have been called, now you are called to do what I did. And to do it more, because there's more of you. And then he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Do you see that there? He says, receive the Holy Spirit, and they did. They received the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And, and it's that Holy Spirit that powers the church's ability to share the grace of Jesus Christ. We're able to communicate with, with power and authority that God loves you, and, and God wants to remu remove from you all the chains that hold you down. He wants to free you from shame and regret and, and guilt so that you can fly, so that you can soar, so that you can live the life that you were created to live. We have been given that message. We are not the message. We are the communicators of God's message into the world. And if we do that, 
then God says you start where you are now. It says in the books of, book of Acts that Jesus said, start with this city. Just start here. And then you'll be empowered to take the gospel to other places because missionaries will rise up from with um, among you and you can send them. You can say to them, as, as Jesus sent us, so we are sending you to take the gospel out into new places. That's how the church grows. The church doesn't grow by being attractional. The church grows by being missional, being on point with our mission. So for us, we are celebrating 135 years, a rich, uh, and there's a lot of great missionary work that this church has done. Now's a great opportunity to reclaim that. We need to do some, we need to do some in-house work first, and that's what we're trying to do right now. We need to get reconnected with each other. COVID took a bite out of us, but we're still here, and we're still cooking, so let's get reconnected. Let's find out each other's gifts. And talents. Let's find out those islands of strength that we can build on. Uh, let's, let's figure all of that out. Uh, and that's what we're going to do right now. But eventually, we want to get out into the third places in Oakland. What are the third places in Oakland? Well, one is coming up. Uh, Santa's Lane is a huge event. Thousands of people come to this thing. And so we've signed up. The session has signed us up to be co-sponsors of that event. And we are going to provide carolers. So if you're a caroler, you want to be a caroler, we're going to have three shifts of carolers. Talk to Jeremy. There he is, right there. We're going to share some Christmas joy and, and then interact. Get everybody down there to interact. The uh, Heritage Festival is coming up in January, and we are signed up to provide whatever volunteers that they need to make that event a success. We're going to be the, vo the volunteer source for that event. And uh, so stay tuned for those things. But another third place literally is on three sides of our property. I've talked about this before. There are people every single day who are just hanging out in their cars, surrounding the church on three sides every single day. Do you know what I'm talking about? The parents at Oakland Avenue Charter School, that's the pickup line. And they are stopped there. Oh my gosh, how can we connect with them? There's got to be a way that we can share grace to them as they're sitting in their cars just doing nothing but talking on the phone or listening to a podcast or whatever, waiting to pick up their kid. What can we do there? That's a third place. But then ask the question also, what are the needs that are closest to our front door? You say, Oakland, it's such a, there's so many big houses, there's such affluence, people don't need anything. Think again. Just because you have a big house doesn't mean that you're not suffering and that you don't have pain and brokenness in your life. You need the gospel. And not everybody in Oakland lives in a big house. Some live in much smaller <laughs> houses, and some people have no house at all. And so Habitat is going to come back into Oakland and start building some houses. Do you think we ought to be a part of that? So that's how we get outside the four walls. Again, it's not about what people get when they come here. It's about what people get when we go out there. Gracious God, I ask that you would um, prepare us now for prayer and that you would let this uh, word that you have spoken to us about how you have sent us, how you are sending us first into our own neighborhoods, that we would, uh, we would think about that. We'd think about our own neighborhoods and our own workplaces and our own schools and our own families that you called us to. How can we be of mission, on mission there in those places? How, as a church, can, can we be a blessing? We can be a good neighbor in our own community. Lord, help us to see that, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
compassionate God. God of power and might. Lord, we are so thankful that we have been able to worship you today in this place or online as the family of faith. Thank you for how you've welcomed us. Lord, you've forgiven us for all the ways that we have tried to make ourselves attractive rather than you. And your message of, of good news, of grace. Lord, there's nothing more attractive than that. And Lord, you call us into the ministry of prayer. You have made us a part of your plan. We, we accomplish our mission, not just by what we do, but how we pray. And so hear us as we pray for our community, for, for the town of Oakland, this address that you have given us, and we pray right now for all the people that live around this church, the people that work <coughs> near this church, the people whose kids are at our school or at the school a few doors down and who drive past our church to get to pick up their kids. Lord, hear us as we pray for the health of our community. There is brokenness all around us. There is fear. There's prejudice. There's insensitivity. And there's greed. Show us the ways that we can bring goodness into our community through what we say and through what we do and how we pray. And then there are those that are close to us. They're in our family. A brother, a sister, a parent, a child, someone in our extended family, someone that we work with, Something that we've noticed is starting to isolate. Or somebody we go to school with. Somebody who's being bullied. Open our eyes to the people that are in our neighborhood. That um, maybe we see as they're out mowing the lawn or picking up the mail. As they go back into their house, do they go back into a place of, of health and wholeness or or brokenness and anxiety. And then we lift up to you in a few silent moments the people that are closest to us. The people that we care about that are in our sphere of influence and compassion. And in these moments, hear us as we lift up our own prayer requests to you. And we pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
know that these flowers were given by one of our families in appreciation for Diane and how she adds to our music? Isn't that cool? Yes. <laughs> Jeremy, have you gotten flowers lately? No? No? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you have heard of the love that God has for you in this place, our task now, as a church, is to take that love out into the world. So dedicate yourself to the Savior who made that love possible, and dedicate yourself right now, or again, to his mission. Friends, go with God's grace to enfold you. Go with the love of Jesus to uphold you. And go with the power of the Spirit to mold you and keep you in great joy. Go in peace. Have a great week. Amen.